everybody. Welcome back. My name is Matt Sadoff, and I'm the Assistant Director of Accessible Technology and Digital Accessibility at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. Our next session will be starting in a moment. Before we do that, I wanted to share these things. We want you to know that this session is being recorded and will be shared after the conference. We have professional captioning services in ASL during today's session. You can access the settings and turn these features on or off in the Zoom menus. Please use the Q&A feature to post your questions. You have the option to post anonymously if you prefer. If you have issues with Zoom, please let us know in chat. We have someone monitoring who can assist you. You can also email us. Please remember to complete the survey after the session. A link and QR code for the survey will be displayed at the end of each session. So I'm excited to introduce our next session, which is titled Accessible Procurement, 10 Questions to Ask. Our presenters are Michael Vaughn and Christine Mangelo from Yale University. Mike joined Yale in February 2018 as the Associate Director of Digital Accessibility, a role created to help grow operational support for digital accessibility at Yale. Reporting to the Director of Web Technologies within Information Technology Services, Mike's team provides consultation, remediation, and training with the goal of creating a world-class accessible online experience at Yale for students, faculty, staff, and visitors. Mike has over 20 years of higher education IT experience. Having previously served as the IT director for Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing with earlier roles directing information technology at Indiana University. Mike is an International Association of Accessibility Professionals certified professional in web accessibility. And Chris joined Yale University in April, 2019 as the digital accessibility coordinator. Her primary re responsibilities include working with vendors, product owners, and procurement staff to integrate accessible language and contracts for digital purchases and to understand best practices to reach compliance with WCAG 2.1 standards. Chris is an International Association of Accessibility Professionals Certified Professional in Accessibility Core Competencies. So thank you both for being here. Looking forward to this. I know I enjoy a lot of, that I've learned on your website already. Great, thank you. So uh, Chris and I are gonna tag team and I think Chris is gonna start with sharing her slides. Uh, let's make sure we do that. And um, I actually have an updated link to the slides that I'd like to share, uh, but actually it's, it's, it's okay. The one thing, it's fine. The slides that are there had the wrong wording for RFP. I get confused by that. Chris, are you sharing? Um. I am trying to find, I did something weird with my screen and I cannot find the option to share. Where did it go? Oh boy. Oh, I. Are you share? Oh, here we go. I got it. Chris, Sorry. I just uh, uh, changed your permissions a little bit to help you out there. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, oh, we are sharing then. Okay, good. I can't tell if it's my slides. Or it's, I apologize for this. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Mike Vaughn. I'm the associate director for our team. Uh, the digital accessibility team at Yale, my team, is within the central IT group. We're not part of the student accessibility services, which provides accommodation to students. And we have the Office of Institutional Equity and Accessibility, which is the ADA, coordinates ADA activities. HR actually provides accommodation support to employees. My team is all about proactively trying to make the digital campus as accessible as we can. Um, I, as mentioned, started in 2018 and had the had one person on my team and have been able to build it up to a fairly sizable team, I know, compared to many other higher education institutions. I think that higher ed should be hiring more people to help with this work. And one of the things that often gets slighted is procurement, which is what we're here to talk with you today about. Um, I'll just mention, we have two engineers on my team that do a lot of front end work. We are very involved with Drupal. Drupal is a big thing. We have over a thousand websites at Yale on Drupal. So they're busy with that. We also support a 
component library, a design system, and to make that as accessible as possible so people who are developing things that aren't on Drupal can utilize that. So we're, we're kind of heavily involved in programming stuff. Uh, we also have a front-end engineer position that's not accessibility focused, but also helps with those efforts. Uh, a digital accessibility specialist, we coordinate with the teaching and learning area. So this position is focused on you know, working directly with faculty and in our Porvu Center for Teaching and Learning. This position is open. If anybody is interested in that work, uh, contact me and I'll share you a link to the, the posting. It does require you to come to New Haven. New Haven is a beautiful place. I would, uh, I, I don't live there myself right now, but, <laughs> uh, and then digital accessibility coordinator uh, who coordinates a lot of our work on our team, but probably the bulk of her work is, she'll describe to you is very heavily involved in procurement. And that's Chris. I'll hand it over to her to go next. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everybody. Again, I'm Chris Mangiolo. Um, I have been with Yale for four years now, a little over four years. And when Yale's accessibility policy took effect in 2018, there were many sessions campus-wide to um, explain to the community the importance of making their products accessible, buying accessible um, for people with disabilities. But it still takes a long time for the community to adapt to new policies and it creates additional work for them. So um, I've learned it takes a lot of patience and perseverance to get the community on board. Um, and to that end, there are three internal questions I was gonna talk about toward achieving those goals. The first one is, are you asking vendors and contractors about accessibility? So to, uh, one way to answer that, to do that is with our, um, putting our accessibility questions in requests for proposals or requests for information or in statements of work. Mike's gonna talk about RFPs later. So I'm gonna talk about statements of work. Um, the language gives detail. Uh, let me open this link here for a second. Oh, we provide language for RFPs. We also, and we have a questionnaire. Well, for statements of work, it gives um, detailed recommendations on how to make your designs accessible by, you know, Heading hierarchy being important, controls stop and start motion on a page, color contrast, et cetera. Um, it, it sets the expectation that we want comprehensive accessibility testing during the build, build phase. And of course, during the launch phase, we expect a VPAT um, a report, uh, an accessibility conformance report that shows that it complies with WCAG 2 AA standards. Um, so those are that's those are some documents we can use to get ahead of, to get some information from the vendor before somebody's made a decision to buy. <clears throat> this form is uh, specific to well, it's our form. It's called Web or Technology Procurement Updates. I call it Accessibility Survey. It was named a long time ago before the procurement had their own intake form. And what happens typically is once a product owner decides to make a purchase, they submit the purchase intake, purchasing intake form. Um, it creates a case number and assigns a buyer to handle the agreement. The buyer reaches out to the product owner and introduces me and asks them to fill out this form. So this form asks the name of the product, the company name, a description of what it does and what it's for. Mo uh, important to me is um, the number of users and whether they're user members of the general public or students um, that helps us decide the level of risk for accessibility and how much negotiating we should do if we need a, um, if their product doesn't meet the standards we, we require. Um, I've found that this, it also helps, I, I use this document when people ask me about accessibility before the procurement department gets in touch with me. And as I've done so over the years, different departments get used to it. They start talking to their teammates about it. And so it's allowed us to have more um, interaction with 
with uh, and start talking about accessibility sooner in the process in some instances it takes a long time and universities tend to work in silos so it helps i i pre i submit this form anytime i can in a conversation with someone who's talking about buying something if i hear about it ahead of time so there's a qu question chris about the the link to the form that Chris included in her slides, and then we realized that it wouldn't do you any good because it's oh, behind, sorry, yes, it's behind it's behind a, a casual. Casual. so sorry. <laughs> you want to see it? I can. Yeah, maybe show it. That'd be good. It's a very simple form. We don't ask a lot of questions, yeah. and it is very poorly named. We did talk about changing that. We need to. Yeah, at some point, <laughs> I think. We are. Oh, it came up fast. So, name of product, name of company, brief description, summary of users the uh, procurement staff member, the current stage of the contracting process, which is often we need this next week. You know, this, um, These two, if somebody has talked to the vendor already about a VPAT and has sent our AA to them, they can upload them here, which is nice. I can get a look at it before I reach out to the vendor. And then the person who's most in the know about the product, the product owner preferably should be the contact here. And uh, if you click through the form, the other thing it does is try to coach people into what the process is. So they'll be informed. You don't need to fill it out, but they'll be asked, do you want us to follow up? Because this just creates a record for us. We use JIRA to track everything. And so it automatically creates the record and moves the data over there. So it facilitates our interaction with them. And then it tells them like, here's what you should do next. Here's what you should ask the vendor about, so. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So um, I've been, I was recently asked, what is the user threshold for software um, that meets accessibility standards as far as the university is concerned? And, um, I typically explain that <clears throat> section, <clears throat> excuse me, section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act prohibits um, entities receiving federal funding from discriminating against people and section in Title III of the ADA prevents um, places of public accommodation from discriminating against people with disabilities, including private universities. And once I say that, and so the answer to this question is it only takes one person to make to file a complaint. So one is the threshold in my mind. That said, most universities don't have the capacity to handle all the digital products that need this kind of accessibility contracting. So um, we created a decision tree for the procurement department to help filter out uh, or give them guidelines to what they can negotiate themselves. And so it basically says these are the parameters to determine when we need to consider accessibility. Humans interact with the product or service electronically using the product or service involving uh, involves a website or browser. The product or service includes electronic materials such as video, audio, PDFs, and eBooks. A product or service produces electronic materials such as electronic reports, communications, and such as emails. And then, if it falls under one of those categories, the decision tree will. It, it's a series of questions, yes or no questions. Will any part of the technology be used by a certain number of members? If the answer is no, you can continue, or members of the public rather, can continue to the next question. Will any part of the technology be used by many students? If no, you can continue to the next question and so on. And if it passes all four questions and the procurement, procurement staff are authorized to negotiate accessibility requirements without our involvement. So this lightens our load a little bit. And we purposely took out the numbers here. We don't publicize the numbers. <laughs> and um, even to our community, we leave this with procurement. Um, and yeah. we, we do talk to the lawyers about what are acceptable numbers. But 
Great. Question number two, are you introducing accessibility requirements in your contract language? So our accessibility addendum uh, revolves around a VPAT, which I'll get into later. Um, VPAT, the term VPAT and ACR are used interchangeably. VPAT is Voluntary Product Accessibility Template, which is the template that's used to create an accessibility conformance report. So you could argue this should say ACR, but we said VPAT. And the it basically says that by our signing this, we um, accept that we understand the state of the application, your application, the vendor's application documented in the VPAT. Um, we do expect, it does oblige the vendor to continue to maintain testing for the accessibility of their pro uh, product. For services rendered such as building a website or a web application, the vendor is obligated to provide a VPAT upon completion of the work. I don't know why this popped up, not at the beginning, but anyway, those are the main things I think I need to talk about, Mike, unless you think there's something else in here. Well, the main thing, the other point, the important point is we just don't accept a VPAT. Like if it's a terrible VPAT, uh, we can create a, a roadmap. So we have exhibit AA1 would be a VPAT that we're accepting. VPAT, exhibit AA2 would be a roadmap that we negotiate on what are you going to do to fix the thing. Um, right. right. Okay. Question number three, do you have the expertise to renew accessibility conformance, uh, to review accessibility conformance reports? Um, so, they're the same thing. Accessibility conformance report is derived from a voluntary product accessibility template. Um, let me open one for a moment. This is the information technology industry council's um, reporting format, which is the leading global reporting format. Now these first nine pages are instructions on how to fill out this, this report, how to create it. And within those instructions, it says that once you're done and before you submit it to delete the instructions. So whenever I get one that already has the instructions in it, that's a red flag for me that this was probably not a well thought out VPAT or report. Um, Yale adheres to WCAG 2.1 AA standards. So we ask that table one success criteria level A and table two success criteria be filled, completed. They don't have, nobody has to complete uh, the AAA. There are also important parts to the first page um, the report date, if it's older than a year, I, I've gotten some that are four and five years old, and I go back to the vendor and say, can you please show me that you've reviewed your products more recently and that it's more accessible than it states here in this report. Um, the evaluation methods are important if there are none there, or if it only, if it says only, um, Automated testing. Automated testing accounts for maybe 30, Mike, or to 40% of finding accessibility issues. So it's not, in our view, a comprehensive review of the product. So it's we would prefer to see that manual and functional testing were performed, that assistive technology like JAWS was used, exclusive use of keyboard testing and uh, code inspection. Those are all, if the evaluation methods listed things like that, we would be more um, confident that it's a good report. When the conf I sometimes see in the conformance level columns next to each criteria that they all say supports down the line with no remarks or explanations, which makes me suspicious that it's too good to be true, and a lot of times it is. Um, 
So, oh, those are all the things I was gonna cover in this slide. <laughs> I think Mike, I think I can turn that over to you now. Yeah, great, thanks, Chris. And just so you're clear, we have framed this around 10 questions, just arbitrarily 10 questions. So the first three of those were really questions to ask about your internal processes. And it was great to have Chris here to talk about those processes. There is a question that's come in. Um, does your procurement process help you determine product accessibility documentation? And someone found our link to Power BI accessibility. Yeah, I mean, the procurement is where we gate a lot of activities that happen with technology. Uh, we have within IT, we have a gating process. So, and I sit on that, and both Chris and I, we shared the responsibility. Um, so as people are thinking about projects, that's a great time to say, hey, what about, what are you doing? Uh, asking questions, are you asking questions about vendors? So there was a big, for the Power BI, there was a big project to decide what are we going to do for data visualization? So we were involved early on in that process. And then we recognize when, we need to provide guidance and we, we don't do as well as we could, but we do have some documentation like you found. Um, uh, and at other times we discover things at the very last second that somebody's bought some software with a P card, which they're not technically allowed to do. <laughs> and then we, um, you know, we need to step in or we often, I, one thing that Chris didn't talk about in terms of our process is how we make exceptions. Uh, and we, our web accessibility policy has guidelines for how we make exceptions in general for accessibility. If somebody's going to go live with a website that's inaccessible, uh, and there's a group, our accessibility uh, steering committee, that includes a few people, lawyers and, and some key decision makers. It's their role to decide what exceptions are made. And uh, the truth is that they've given us a lot of leeway for less risky decisions to, to make it, to allow things to go forward or not. We're usually not just saying, uh, you know, we, we're expecting roadmaps and we're expecting accommodation plans. We're connecting people who are buying and accessible stuff with the, the Student Accessibility Services Office so that they can know. So, um, but just to be clear, be clear, we're more often than not just trying to get whatever we can we're probably not policing as much as some universities who have the authority to say, no, you can't buy this. We do that in some cases, but more often than not, we're, um, we're, we're doing a lot of negotiations. So that's why Chris is very busy. Those negotiations can be very nuanced and challenging. So I'll go ahead and share I, my slide. Yeah, one ahead. second. I forgot to mention the old section 508 VPEN. 508 VPEN. Oh, you want to go ahead and show that then? One tip she has. If when you ask a vendor for a VPAT, you get, who is that shared? Can you see that? No. Yes. Um, if you get the, uh, the old section 508 VPAT has a four digit number, the criteria is four digit number before the decimal. That VPAT does not include WCAG2 um, criteria. So I would send it back and say, this is an old VPAT. We need one that includes WCAG um, two criteria, which on the right side here, that's what it looks like. That's all I wanted to say. Great, yeah. Fortunately, we don't see a lot of those. So five no, years ago- anymore. Used to. <laughs> Great, thanks, Chris. And I'll share my slides so we continue. Okay. Um, So this, this, we're all within this question three, this like, do you have the expertise to review your ACRs? And so Chris has talked about what the ACR format looks like and some things, uh, the quick evaluation she mentioned, you know, look for a version 2.0. So if you have something before that, you're seeing that old section 508, um, make sure the report date is no longer than a year or so ago. The contact information ideally should point to somebody who's an ex, you know, dedicated to accessibility. Um, not just, you know, support at adobe.com or something like that. Uh, and she mentioned the evaluation methods used. If you don't have a lot of expertise, looking at all the success criteria can be a bit challenging. Like what, which of these is important and what does it mean if it says partially supported or does not support? Does not support usually is pretty bad. 
partially supported is oft, usually bad too. If you see a VPAT that has supported, supported, supported for everything, that's usually a red flag. <laughs> um, the point I want to make it is that I think it really is important to de de develop some expertise within the university to be able to make sense of these. Not, I don't think it's realistic for every person who's making a purchase to be able to do that. And um, that's why we've prioritized having Chris to be there to help and that we prioritize looking at this. If you develop an expertise, you can look at these things pretty quickly and understand. So um, one thing I one tip I did want to have is if you don't have a lot of experience with the success criteria, I would jump to 2.1.1, which is the keyboard. Make sure it supports keyboard access to the application. That's often something that is not done well and uh, is a key quick indicator. Um, so I, I also wanted to point out here that the, the Office of Civil Rights in the Department of Education and the Department of Justice has their own Office of Civil Rights. They typically, higher ed, I'm sure many of you here probably have been visited by uh, the Office of Civil Rights when there's been a complaint. Um, if you need ammunition to go back to your leadership and say, hey, you know, we really need expertise to be able to help us evaluate the products that we're buying and evaluate the accessibility conformance reports, it can be helpful just to go look at a recent settlement. And so I just randomly picked a recent settlement uh, and I'll pull it up here. So, um, one thing I've noticed that's interesting of late is that the, um, well, in this agreement, I highlighted one, the college will request the vendor to complete its remediation of all barriers within six months of the signature date of this agreement. So if you buy a product that's inaccessible, OCR could come knocking and they would say, hey, you have six months to get this fixed. <laughs> they often have unrealistic expectations uh, of the time it takes to do things. And uh, college will engage in independent testing or otherwise confirm the validity of any vendor offered accessibility assessment of its own product. So uh, it's not just me recommending this, the government who is enforcing Section 504 and the ADA, they really expect colleges to be able to do this. Uh, the good thing is that the Department of Education does provide assistance. So if you need help learning, this appendix here talks about you need to adopt a standard and you need to follow that standard. But here's like the, the few things that we think you really need to focus on. So this is helpful and I encourage you to read this. They talk about keyboard access and they just go into a brief description of what that means and how you should be able to do that. Logical reading order, having skip links on your page. So when you press the tab key, the first time, first thing you come to on a page ideally should be a skip link visual focus indicators, your alternative text, links, your use of color, color contrast, tables, buttons, form controls, heading structure, embedded videos, magnification. This seems like a lot, but this is just two pages with some helpful guidance and it's a good place to start. Um, so I just wanted to make the clear why procurement really is important. And the truth is that most of what we do in the university, we're dependent on vendors uh, for our digital solutions. We're not typically building a lot of our own custom stuff. So uh, this, I think, is very important. Uh, the other thing that that document links to, and I have a link to here, are the Office of Civil Rights video series, and they touch on all of those points that they pointed out in that appendix uh, with guidance. Um, I'm going to, if someone, if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them as we go. If somebody could help uh, moderate that for me would be great. I can do that, but, um, but oh, here, here's one. Mm -hmm. Is is there a link to the OCR settlement agreement? Yes, in the slides. Oh, and right there, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. I'll, I'll go on. Um, oh, I did want to pop out here real quick and take a look at some VPATs. The uh, Microsoft is a great company when it comes to their VPATs. So if you ever want to see some good examples and of a, a company, one being upfront up with their product, you can just do uh, Microsoft Accessibility Conformance Reports, do a search and you'll find this. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't think I have a link to share, but you can do that search. Um, you'll see that for, they have all their products out here publicly available. You can click on one 
and they'll have it in all these different versions. So what Chris was showing you was a VPAT or an ACR that was aligned with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. If your standard is Section 508, there are additional things beyond WCAG that are included. Um, so this report format is aligned with that. The other thing that's different about Section 508 is that it's WCAG 2.0. So uh, it does, doesn't necessarily include that. The EN 301.549 is a European standard. So this VPAT just has more stuff in it to accommodate those standards. Um, and you can just click on these and download them. Uh, you don't have to sign a non-disclosure agreement, which some companies force you to do. Oh, um, sorry. Here it is. This is what the Microsoft VPAT looks like. You can see the date is within a year, so they're keeping them up to date. They're telling you what version of the VPAT they're using, the methods, uh, uh, product description, they describe their methods, uh, and they've taken out the instructions. The Whenever you have partially supports, then you should expect a, a remark that explains what why does it partially support. And if you develop expertise, these the, those remarks should make sense, or you can look at a remark and say, they don't know what they're talking about. And so it can, can be helpful. Um, so there's a good example. Adobe, so here's an Adobe report. To their credit, they put this online, so it's widely available. Um, you see the date, however, is from 2018, so that's not good. This is a performance report for, oh, I didn't want to look at that one. Uh, let's look at this one. This is Adobe Captivate 2019. They do some weird things with their report. This is, doesn't exactly follow the format. They've put data in for the software. So the software that you use to create training materials, Adobe Captivate is for building training materials. And they, um, so they included that in here along with the, exported content, which is typically what you're more concerned about, because maybe you have two people in a department who are developing training, but it's being output and put on the web for everybody in the university to use. So that's, you know, it's helpful to have that separated and to be able to focus on that. Um, and if I jump down to 211 here, which is keyboard, they say it supports, it says for the software, it does not support. So if you have anybody with a disability, I guess you can't hire them into your, I'm sorry, you have to be able to hire them, but it would make it much more challenging to accommodate that they're being able to do the job of developing training. But nonetheless, this says supports in the authored content functionality can be operated through a keyboard interface. I know for a fact that this is not true. <laughs> there are many things you can do in Adobe Captivate, like put a link in a slide, and when you export that to HTML, it does not work. You cannot operate it with a keyboard. So um, that it then gets to the challenge of how much do you trust these VPATs? We often do trust them in terms of negotiation with our contracts if it's not high risk. But when it gets into a higher level of risk like this, because this would impact uh, potentially used by all employees at the university, then we actually test the product. And that's where we have the engineers who understand and can confirm or are not these requirements. Okay. Um, I then I went through the WCAG 2.1 AA criteria and I just put in the list here. These are the criteria that actually align with what the Department of Education OCR listed on their page, their appendix with the two pages of things to check. They, they all fall under these success criteria. And so if you wanted to look at your VPATs and focus on certain ones, it's, it's still a pretty long list, but that, that may be helpful in terms of focusing. Are we doing okay with questions, Chris? There, there is one in the Q&A. Yeah. Do you have time for that? Would you like me to read it or? Yes, why don't you please? It says, do you find that sometimes vendors return the signed contracts without the accessibility addendum and or completely ignore it? This is the first part. <laughs> Does the accessibility department have the ability to stop procurement or have a follow-up cycle with the vendor if the number and or type of people that want to use the application determine that? Yeah, Chris, do you want to answer that? Uh, the first part... Do you find that sometimes vendors return the signed contract? Yes. Um, 
and well, sometimes they just say they're not going to sign it. Um, so in that instance, we have to decide on the level of risk and go to the accessibility steering committee sometimes to make sure that it's see how they want to proceed. Another thing we can do is um, try to work out an accommodation plan if that's possible. Um, sometimes with course material, if it's not required to finish the course, then we can let the forego the AA. What am I missing, Mike? Yeah, so I we, we, we it it varies for every engagement. Yeah. Chris, Chris and I do a lot of work to try to get whatever we can. And so we, but then ultimately, if it's high enough risk, we involve the lawyers <laughs> and the lawyers ultimately will help us make a decision on what to accept or not. A lot of times lawyers get involved talking to lawyers, so they'll call, uh, want to have conversations. And, and we also meet with vendors a lot to kind of as part of these negotiations. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Um, That's great. Are you, there's a few more that have come in. Yeah. Like, uh, I'll go ahead and read them since I see them. Okay. Have you encountered any situations where a VPAT was wrong? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we will point it out to vendors. Um, uh, oftentimes, you have to wait a long time for the vendors to follow up. So that's the other thing that we do. And we're, we're, we have the luxury that Chris can help us with this. In JIRA, we keep track of everything. So when we're, something's wrong in the VPAT or we reach out to them, oftentimes we'll, we do an assessment of a product before we buy it, and we have a lot of findings. And those findings will become part of the roadmap that you need to correct everything that we found, or at least the high. We also rate our, our criteria, so high, medium, low, critical, high, medium, low. So we will often ask for the critical and high things to be fixed by a certain date. And so she follows up with them on that. Some vendors do a good job of having an issue tracking system where you can go check the status. Most vendors don't. Uh, some vendors are big behemoths and there's not much you can do. I mentioned Microsoft. They do great work with accessibility, but if you want to get a contract with them, forget about it. I don't know. Maybe a system, like North Carolina system could do that, but um, we also have challenges in the student, student space, the student systems. We use Banner. They've been we had lots of lawyers talking to lawyers in that case. Um, I, I won't. Yeah. So I, I imagine a lot of you are familiar with this. Um, let's see the next question. How do you handle vendors that don't have a VPAT? Oh, I think we, we've talked about that. Uh, we do have situations where vendors don't have VPATs because they don't have a program. And the roadmap is, hey, you need to build up a program and you need to, to come up with a VPAT. And so that'll be our first expectation. And um, we may go from there, maybe if it's the three-year term, oftentimes we'll negotiate how long we're allowing something to be in place or in use uh, so that they understand that we may not renew if they don't follow through. Right, and I work with the procurement person to follow up like when the contract, a month or so before the contract's supposed to renew to see, to ask the same questions again. Another thing I do is add an exhibit to the AA that says, and ask the vendor to commit to providing one in three months or six months or. And the final question, I'll have to speed it along. And I apologize to our interpreters for talking too fast. Um, the the VPATs, uh, are VPATs internally, or do they are they completed internally, or do they hire third parties? More often, well over ninety percent of the VPATs are not done by third party experts. We love to see that, and we do encourage it. And we, particularly if they haven't created a VPAT, we give them advice on where to go to, for help with that. Um, so let me continue, and I'll have to quickly. So now we're getting into questions that are really what you should be asking the vendors, and I've given some examples of some good answers, and. Um, so what kind of accessibility program do you have in place? Uh, good answers would be, we have dedicated positions focused on our processes for building accessible solutions. We provide trainings, not just to our developers, but to project managers, anybody who's, the earlier in a project you can address accessibility, the better. So your project managers need to know when they're building the project plan that people, maybe they need training. Uh, so make sure that that's happening. Uh, we conduct automated and manual testing. So if they talk about, hey, we use Wave, you know, that's not good enough. That'll give you an idea. 
Um, we build test coverage into our software development process. So if you're a geek and you understand how software development is done, you can really drill in and say, hey, what product are you using in your pipelines for when code's submitted? You know, you can get to the detail of, and what are your developers using to lend their code? Um, so that, that may be something you can't uh, address unless you have somebody with that expertise. And do we include people with disabilities in our user testing? That would be a great thing. That's often not happening. Question five for your vendors, do you have an accessibility conformance report? So yes, would be a good answer. Uh, and we're using the latest version and it's not older than 12 months. We publish it to our website and we don't require it in NDA. That's, you know, some companies do that. I don't, that's not that terrible, but it's just kind of a sign that they aren't very, um, you know, supportive of um, their inclusion efforts. Question number six, are your online product documentation and support resources accessible? So not just the thing you're selling us, but everything that goes along with it. If somebody has to contact you or submit a ticket, is that process accessible? Are your support documentations accessible? The PDF documents, which we won't get into, maybe there was a session today, and I apologize, I haven't been able to attend any of the other sessions, but it looked like there was some good stuff. I think somebody was talking about document. Is it PDF UA or Wicked compliant on, on those sites? And those are also things that you can test for. Question number seven, if your product does not conform to our standards, what is your plan to achieve full conformance and what do we do in the meantime? So vendors usually are not going to be too helpful in helping you think through your accommodation plans. So that's something that is, needs to be part of your internal processes, but they should be upfront about what their roadmap is and ideally with target dates, that's what we strongly try to get in our contract. Uh, maybe in your contract, you agree to include penalties for the missed targets so that you, you're really holding them accountable. Uh, ideally, good vendors who know that there are ways to effectively use their product and accommodate accessibility will have that kind of documentation on their website. Question number eight, can your product be used using only a keyboard? And is there always a visual indication to know where the keyboard focus is? And a good answer is yes, and let me show you. So I know, uh, a lot of, it can be challenging to get involved in all the demos that happen related to products, but it's a great strategy to have a vendor demo to you how they could do something in the product using a keyboard. Uh, I was gonna spend a little bit of time kind of talking about keyboard testing, but I know that there's a session coming up later that will go into that, so I won't spend much. I did wanna show here's North South Carolina does a good job with their focus indicator. I come to the site and North Carolina does too, but I wanted to pick on South Carolina for a little bit. The skip to main content link there's at the top. That's what we mean by skip links, and that's good. I can see where I am as I go along. Now, when I get down here, okay, it's all good. I get into that chat support. I'm pressing tab, 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 and nothing is happening. So what's happening, actually, when you click this, there are these links that, that I'm getting to that's hidden from me. So that, that's the kind of thing that you'll see a lot with keyboard testing. Here's a... A bad example, this is fly South, South Southern Air, Airways. So I'll reload this page and I press tab and I'm going through content that's hidden behind this little thing that's on top and I can't see where I am. And most importantly, I can't even get to that little X over there to close this stupid modal dialog. So this is a terrible example. It's especially terrible because airlines are subject to the ACAA, uh, uh, the Air Carriers Access Act that kind of requires them to be 2.0 compliant. Okay, let's continue. Question number nine, is your product compatible with common assistive technologies like JAWS, NVDA, VoiceOver, et cetera? Good answer, yes. And let me show you how well it works. Oftentimes they're not gonna be able to do this, so this might be a stretch, but ideally you have team members who can do a little bit of this testing to confirm. And finally, question number 10, do you prior prioritize accessibility bugs with the same priority as an equivalent loss of functionality for individuals without a disability? So good answers would be yes, we do. And we have a process for uh, all accessibility issues of bugs, rather uh, treating them as bugs rather than feature requests. You, some vendors, they have you report accessibility bugs as if it's a feature request and they have people vote on it, <laughs> which, uh, which is just terrible. Um, they should make it easy for people to report bugs. 
we one of the things in our policy and one of the things that we ask for from vendors is the ability to have a link to our accessibility page within their platform so that we make it easy if, for anybody who's somewhere using our stuff to report a problem. And so that's part of our contract requirements. And with that, I think we'll open it up for questions if we have time. I, we're at right 2.45, and I'm sorry we took longer than expected, but hopefully that was helpful information. Mike and Chris, thank you so much. Yes, if anybody else has any additional questions, you can put it in the Q&A so that we can get to those. Somebody said they couldn't keep up, and I apologize. <laughs> but it is being recorded, and the links are all accessible. So um, hopefully that will be help some helpful resources if you go back over it. I appreciate you sharing not just the process, but the, the links and examples that you gave, as well as um, suggestions for people. As we know, everybody has a little bit different um, scenario that they're working with as far as uh, with people and, and setting. And so uh, I appreciate you giving a lot of options with that. I'm not seeing any other questions. So thank you, Mike and Chris. I appreciate you being here and being a part of it. Um, for all the attendees, remember, if you can do the survey, that is, uh, there's a link in the chat. Um, oh, there's one that caught me right at the end. It's about to sign off. But uh, the last uh, next question, any resources on how to build a good VPAT template? So that's a good question. I, I recently did this for a company because I wanted to see the other side. So I did a little side gig uh, and helped the company with a VPAT. Um, there are, MicroAssist is a partner that we work with sometimes to supplement the work that we do. They're a company in Texas, one of the an accessibility vendor. They have a training that they provide on doing that, or I'm sorry, their training might be on evaluating VPATs. Uh, but I imagine if you reach out to one of those vendors like Level Access or TPGI or DQ, they probably would, uh, they certainly have the services to develop the VPATs for you. Uh, that whether there's a training, that's a good question. I don't know if anybody in the group knows of one. I When I did it, you, one, you have to have a fair amount of expertise to, to do it because you need to completely audit the report. And whatever you're doing the VPAT for, it, it's, it's, it's much harder to develop a VPAT than it is to evaluate a VPAT or a product. The luxury that we have uh, as testers buying the product is that we can just go and check on some things and know you're failing or you're doing pretty well. Um, somebody who's doing a VPAT as a third party, they have to evaluate everything and report if there are problems. So that it does take time and effort. It's not just about filling out a form. You have to do the audit. You often are going to work with a vendor to try to fix things before we publicize the final report. Uh, a group like Microsoft, they have a whole team and a process that does this for lots of products, every, you know, recurring over a recurring time. In those situations, uh, you've got to develop processes that are tied into your product development process. So it's it's not an easy thing to do. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. I'm not aware of, speci of a specific training to help with that. So another question, I'll read it. Do some items also apply to internally built products applications? Um, does your group share not VPAT, but con the content of it to help developers guide their work? So we, my team has a, a WCAG checklist that it's a VPAT is doesn't give you any guidance. Like it has a success criteria that you need to follow keyboard, but it doesn't give you any ideas of like, what does that mean? So for our developers, we don't give them a VPAT. We give them a checklist that, that says, this is what this means. And like, do your image attributes in your page have the alt attribute? And um, so it, it's a bit 
easier to use and consume. So that's what we do for our, our developers. We're often not creating VPATs that are published, although sometimes that does happen. Uh, our Yale, um, the Yale um, Press, Yale Press, they sell their products to others. So they have VPATs. They actually work with Microsys, who I mentioned, in helping them produce those VPATs. And that's how they approach that. So hopefully that answers that question. Any common mistakes you are aware, oops. Another question, any common mistakes you are aware of with establishing a VPAT? I like the checklist idea. This helps to set the expectation. Common mistakes. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by the question, that, but as I was mentioning, the developers, you know, they don't know what VPAT means. And even if we call it an ACR, we just call it the WCAG checklist. They, they understand that and we'll accept that. For higher risk things, we often get involved in doing an assessment and that becomes a checklist so that we don't force a developer to then go through it again and do it on their own. But um, yeah, so I'm, is, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Okay, good. <laughs> It's intent to sign off again. So uh, hopefully we've gotten all the questions answers. Again, appreciate everybody being here and being a part. Um, if you'll complete the survey for after the session and everybody else can take a, a few minute break. Um, but once again, thank you, Mike and Chris, for your valuable experiences and expertise and um, everything that you shared with us today. Great. And feel free to reach out to us if you have additional questions. Yeah. Thank you.